Hello, we're going to dive into the poetical books next. We've just finished the 17 historical books from Genesis, and it's been uh, an interesting journey, a quite eventful journey. But now we're going to kind of come out into the flat and the smooth. We've been climbing up the mountain for a long time, and we're going to try to enjoy some things here in our personal relationship and experiential relationship uh, with the Lord and with God here. Now, in looking at these 17 historical books we've just passed through, let's just kind of take a look at them uh, on the board right here. They are divided into five books, and then nine books, and then three books. Of course, you'll recognize the first five, the Pentateuch, Genesis through Deuteronomy, and then the nine books of history that we go through next are Joshua through Second Chronicles, and then the last three right here, the little books in the uh, after the exile, the return, uh, Ezra through Esther. And I want to give a kind of a topic of these three different sections of the historical book. In the first place, with regards to God's provision or the promised land, uh, we have preparation, first of all. Preparation. So that uh, all of the books of the law, that is of the Pentateuch, our preparation for going into the provision of God through Deuteronomy. And then starting with Joshua and going on down to uh, the, the Second Chronicles, we have possession or uh, occupation of the land. And in that period of time, they were in more or less control of the land. But now we have dispossession in the last, uh, in the last three of them. So the Pentateuch, preparation, uh, the historical, the other mid-historical books, occupation, and the last three, Ezra, Nehemiah, uh, or uh, Esther, Ezra, and Nehemiah, we have dispossession. Now, let's take a look at these poetical books, uh, sort of give us an overview of them to, uh, altogether. Now, these historical books here, they have to do with the Hebrew nation, with the race, uh, they're very sub they're very subjective, or I should say, objective in their approach. But the poetical books that we're coming to now uh, are from individuals, probably about individuals. They come out of the human heart, out of the human experience. So these are more experiential books, uh, rather than objective books that deal with history and facts and and this sort of thing. Uh, much more contemplative now. Now, of course, you know the poetical books would be Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. Uh, now, let's take a look at Hebrew poetry in general. Now, the poetry in the Old Testament is not limited to just these five books. They occur in many places. Of course, there's, uh, there's a poetic form in most of the prophets, particularly the major prophets. But uh, poetry refers, refers to a form uh, in which we place these words. It doesn't mean like a lot of our, our modern poetry or poetry that sort of stream of consciousness, wild imagining, sort of fantastic sort of a thing. Uh, they portray, this poetry portrays real human experience, the timeless kind. And so we're not going to our timeline today because uh, this kind of uh, the poetic books and these that I've just mentioned, they have a timeless sort of appeal. Uh, the, more, the longer you live, you, the more you realize that people are the same in every age. They just have different toys to play with and different ways to do certain things. But at the heart and at the core of it, the problems that we have today, the basic problems that we have today, are the same ones that David and Moses and Solomon and men like that had. Now, uh, there is a particular thrust to these experiences. They're not just random experiences, although from time to time, particularly in books like Ecclesiastes, it may seem like there's no reference there uh, except just to the randomness of life. But these experiences are all somehow connected with God. They're either in flight or reaction from God uh, or in moving towards God. And that's where all of us are in our lives in one way or another. Now, if we look at each, each, all of these five books, Job through Song of Solomon, and look at the main lesson or subject that comes out of these, or the, or the subject of each book, we see a kind of a collective spiritual progress 
through these books that we can apply to our own lives, for instance. And we're going to put up on the screen a, uh, a chart here, kind of an outline of these five books, Job through Song of Solomon. And we're going to show you the theme of each book uh, and uh, how that is a progressive, uh, uh, it represents a progressiveness in our, Christian, in our Christian life when you really get serious uh, with God. And first of all, the book of Job, there is the death of the self-life. The death of the self-life. Oh, how self continues to want to live. But when we move from the human side to the divine side, that's the first thing that has to be dealt with. Now, Psalms, the theme of that is new life in God through praise or praise through prayer. A new life in God. Once you've gotten rid of the self-life, then you can really put your attention upon God. That's our problem a lot of times in praise and worship. I think the thrust of the present praise and worship movement is to get our attention upon God and not our own problems. Now then the third uh, part of this progress is that of the book of Proverbs, which gets, sets forth heavenly but practical wisdom. Uh, how to use the wisdom of heaven to live on earth. And then the fourth stage in this progression is a theme of the book of Ecclesiastes, which is set your affections on high, the things that are on high, not on earth. In fact, the writer, as we shall see in a few moments, are in, in this lecture, the writer shows the futileness, the vanity of everything that has to do with human or secular life. So you have to set your affections on things on high. And then the Song of Solomon, the theme is a bliss through union with Christ. Bliss through union with Christ. Now there are some lessons that we can learn in our own Christian life from this too. Uh, those are kind of themes of that passage which represent that I just gave you that indicate a, a sort of a progression of spiritual growth and maturity. Now there's some Christian lessons uh, that we may learn from each of these five books uh, in, this, uh, in this whole matter and that is Number one, in Job, we learn to abhor badness, our own badness, but we also learn to abhor our goodness. Job didn't make any progress until he realized that his goodness was of no more use to God than was his badness, and that unless he depended on him. Now when we move into the psalm, we learn how to live by faith of the Son of God. The reading of the psalms is a tremendous faith builder. For well, they speak all through of the praise of God. And that is the seed, that is the fertilizer, you might say, of our faith. Now, in uh, Proverbs, we learn to subject our will to Christ, who is the wisdom of God. We must learn to subject our will to Christ. And it's a very good prog uh, program to read one of the Psalms every day. There's enough of them, there's 31 of them to go through all of the months. Uh, each day of the month, and uh, you can every month, you can go through the Psalms and you get in you uh, what the wisdom of God is and how to subject your will to Christ and obedience to it. And then in Ecclesiastes, we learn how to get deliverance from the spirit of this world. And we're going to talk about that in just a, mo just a moment, how the spirit of the world is a, is a subtle thing. It's a siren call. Uh, and uh, we must learn how to avoid it, and Ecclesiastes tells us how to do that. And then finally, out of the Song of Solomon, uh, we realize that there is joy unspeakable as we come in union and fellowship with Christ. It's a tremendous allegory of that spiritual experience. All right, now while we're still dealing with the whole outlines of, of poetry, Hebrew poetry, Let's begin by making a comparison with Hebrew poetry and English poetry. And we'll start with English poetry first. Let's go to the board here, and uh, it'll help us to understand as I write these down. Uh, of course, most of us know that English poetry, or at least a lot of it, has what we call rhyme. You know, roses are red, violets are blue, I love you, and so forth like that. So we want to get a rhyme in, rhyme in there. So rhyme is one of the features, uh, one of the features of English poetry. And this is a parallelism of sound or phonet phonet phoneticism, a phonic uh, or sound parallelism. 
so that at the end of every other line you have words that sound alike. It's a parallelism of sound. Now, you might recognize that uh, you cannot translate poetry, uh, the rhyme of poetry, from one language to another because the words, of course, that you use to translate uh, the same words that would rhyme in one language do not rhyme in the other language. Now, English poetry also has uh, a, a parallelism of rhythm. A, a parallelism of, of rhythm, or we call it a, a time parallelism, a metric parallelism. So that gives us sort of a, a little pattern, uh, a, a regular chronological pattern to the things. So, uh, you know, ta da ta da ta da ta da 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 in blank verse, but they did have rhythm, and mostly it was in iambic pentameter. I won't go into that, but that's uh, one of the various patterns of, uh, of rhythm that uh, is used as a device in English poetry, but it was called blank verse simply because it had rhythm but no rhyme. Now, Hebrew poetry, by comparison, or contrast, I should say, is a parallelism of ideas. And I want to circle that because that is the genius of Hebrew poetry. It's not a mechanical or technical kind of a parallelism, parallelism as much as it is a philosophical or a conceptual parallelism. Now, in this parallelism, there are at least three types. There are a lot of subtypes, but these are the ones that we're going to deal in here. There's an excellent course on the seminary level in the uh, wisdom literature taught by Dr. Fount Schultz, and he really gets into the, uh, into the technical matters of this, and it's not just technical because he draws a lot of very good spiritual lessons out of it. But in this course, of course, we can only just kind of touch the, the broad parameters of this whole subject. So uh, uh, we'll have these various uh, aspects or types of parallelism. There are three of them that I want to deal with that are going to coming that are coming up on the screen. First of all, there is a completive parallel, uh, a completive parallel, and as the name suggests, it's a parallel that completes something. Now, an example of that is now that's not uh, that's not identicalness. In other words, you got the two members of the uh, little parallel there the, of, the, of the little phrase, and the first number is given, and the second concurs with it and may develop it further. Uh, and as I say, this is not identicalness. It's a completive sort of a thing. Now in Psalm 46, 1, we have an example of that. God is our refuge and strength, and the second member completes it, a very present help in trouble. And that's a completeness. Now, Psalm 19.7 is another example of that. Psalm chapter 19, verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Now, that's the first member. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. So these are examples of completive parallelism. Now, there's an interesting uh, kind of a completive parallelism in Psalm 1. I've always liked this, and it really makes a lot of good preaching right here. Let me uh, get to the board on this. Uh, this is a triple uh, completive parallelism. It's, it's triple. Now you have, in the first case, you have a man who starts out, uh, the, the King James says he walketh, and then he standeth, is the next progression, and then he sitteth. Now, to match these over here in the second column, uh, he uh, blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel, 
or standeth in the way, nor sitteth in the seat. Now the third column over here, uh, it's the ungodly, the counsel of the ungodly, or standeth in the way of sinners, or sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Now, coming back over here, I want you to see that the first all the way across is a more or less casual kind of a relationship. This is a more serious kind of relationship. And this is really a committed relationship. And they progress one to the other. And this is a kind of a triple parallelism. So. A casual thing, you might walk by and hear the counsel of the ungodly. We hear a lot of counsel of the ungodly. And the ungodly are just those that are not godly. They may not be very bad uh, in a relative humanistic kind of a sense. But they're just simply, they don't take God into account. Now, you're in trouble. Now, if you keep on walking by, you won't have any problem. But you can get in trouble if you stop long enough to, to concern not only just the counsel, but the way of sinners. I think sometimes of uh, people who get hooked in the occult. It may be the first place they just read a horoscope in the newspaper. So I think I'll see what my horoscope is today. The next thing, you're committed to this thing. If it works out for you, or it says something specific to you, a lot of people will say, hey, this is a pretty good way to get, to, to get knowledge. And... Uh, the ungodly being separated from the sinners is those who are very actively knowing what they do in, in full knowledge that they are not only ungodly, but they actually sinners as a way of life. Now then, if you run with them in the way, then you, you, you come to a, a place where you sit with them in the places of authority, and you become scornful of the godly. And uh, this, is a, this is a beautiful triple parallelism in the book of Psalms here. Now, a second type of parallelism is what we call contrastive parallel. Contrastive parallels. Now, some of these we see in the, in the Proverbs. Proverbs uh, chapter 3, verse 5. Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not to your own understanding. So you have a contrastive. Trust in the Lord, do not lean to your own understanding. Chapter 14, verse 11 uh, is another. We could just point out hundreds of these uh, throughout here. The house of the wicked will be overthrown, but the tent of the upright will flourish. The middle portions of Proverbs, as we shall see when we get to that book, are just full of these kinds of contrastive parallels. One of them in the Psalms, uh, Psalm 32.10, Psalm 32.10, if I can find it here. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. Now, in, so in, in Isaiah 65, there's an example of successive parallelism that I just want to point out before we leave that. That's a little different than just simple uh, contrastive parallelism. In uh, Isaiah 65, verse 13, Therefore says the Lord God, Behold, my servant shall eat, but you shall be hungry. Behold, my servant shall drink, but you shall be thirsty. Behold, my servant shall rejoice, but you shall be ashamed. So it just goes on like that, these contrastive parallels that are heaped up uh, in just that way. This is called successive parallelism. And that can get to building. You know, uh, if you've ever heard a good black preacher, uh, he develops a lot of those kind of proverbs. And he talks about the righteous shall be this and the unrighteous shall be this. The righteous shall be this. And I've heard them go on sometimes uh, for just uh, tens of minutes, you know, 10, 20 minutes doing that same thing uh, until he worked up or uh, the people really got worked up, not so much by manipulation, but by the realization of the difference between those that were 
following after God and those that were not following after God. And the Psalms and this poetic literature reminds us quite often in these passages of the difference between the two by this form of parallelism. Now, a third kind of parallelism that we want to look at is that of the proverb or, or constructive parallels. Constructive parallels. And we find an example of this in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 17. I think these uh, scripture passages are in your notes so that you don't have to spend a lot of time writing it down. You can go ahead and look it up if you want to. Now, the I here is used as the subject of a, of a constructive parallel that builds. The eye that mocks his father and scorns obedience to his mother, the ravens of the valley will pick it out and the young eagles will eat it. Now the word I here is used as a symbol for the person themselves or for that person's personality or their will. And uh, it uses two completive parallels uh, to construct this and to express it. Uh, turning to Isaiah chapter 60, we have another constructive parallel that has three completive parallels uh, within this constructive parallel. Uh, Isaiah chapter 60, verse 6. Isaiah 60, verse 6. <clears throat> The multitude of camels shall cover your land, the dromedaries of Midian and Ephah. All those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense, and they shall proclaim the praises of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered together to you. The rams of Nebaioth shall minister to you. They shall ascend with acceptance on my altar, and I will glorify the house of my glory. These are three completive parallels that are constructive, that is, they build towards something. Now, knowing this about Hebrew poetry helps you somewhat in the understanding or the interpretation of the scriptural passage. For instance, in Psalm 11.4, there is something here that we might not know unless we followed through on it. Uh, in Psalm 11.4, it says, The Lord is in His holy temple. Now, which one do we mean? Uh, well, knowing something about Hebrew poetry, it says the Lord's throne is in heaven. Now, knowing that, then we know it's the heavenly temple, not the earthly temple. And uh, this is a psalm of David, and if it's a psalm of David, then we know that what? Well, we know that the temple on earth had not been built yet. It was not built until the time of Solomon. So, uh, but the parallelism here tells us the Lord is in his holy temple, the Lord's throne is in heaven. When we know that the second part uh, is a constructive or completive, could be either. Now, one of the things about this kind of parallelism, a parallelism, as we said, we had up here before, a parallelism of ideas, is that they can be translated into any language. And God knew that all ahead of time. And so, of course, it has been. And it loses nothing in the translation. Uh, most other kinds of, of uh, poetry that depends upon technical devices and the sounds of things and the rhythm of things, as we've already pointed out, just cannot be translated in another language. If you doubt that, just see how difficult it is sometimes to translate a song from one language to another. The rhythm is all off. You almost have to rewrite the music because in good music, the words and the, and this, and the music, uh, you know, bear together. And there's a sort of rhythm and, and, a, and a meter to all of it. And you translate it in another language, uh, it, it's very difficult. I, when I went to South America or down to Argentina a few years ago, I had hoped to take some courses down there and get one of the men to translate them. And he said, well, it's very difficult. He said, even if you get some approximation of the words that are involved, the feel of it is all wrong. The, uh, just the aura about it just is not the same thing. doesn't have the same impact, he said. So uh, while I was down there, I, I, I tried to remember as many songs as I, I could remember that had hallelujah in them. And uh, so hallelujah is a kind of a universal uh, sound in language, and so we did a lot of those. Well, 
Let's go on and talk about now the two categories of poetical books, because we're going to break this down just for a moment. And of the five books that we call the poetic books, we can break them down even further. There's one category that we will deal with in the second half of this 90-minute uh, period, and that is the wisdom literature, which is composed of Job and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Now, these are in a different category than the other two books. Of course, that leaves us Psalms and Song of Solomon. Now, Psalms is uh, a liturgical sort of thing. I think we don't realize how much the Psalms were used in the worship, the liturgical worship of Israel. We tend to use them a lot for personal uh, benefit and prayer and that sort of thing. But they were used regularly in the worship of Israel and for years have been sung in the synagogues. Um, in fact, a lot in the early days of the Reformed movement or the Reformation and on through the time of Calvin and in this country, uh, the Puritans and all, they, in fact, that was about the only thing they wanted to sing was to sing the Psalms. So there's a great cooperative uh, liturgical use of the Psalms, and of course the Song of Solomon uh, is not so much wisdom as it is allegory, poetical allegory. So we're going to deal in the remaining time that we have in this uh, period with Psalms and with uh, the Song of Solomon. Let's take a look at Psalms as a collection first, and Psalms, we have said, is praise through prayer. If you recall the outline that I gave you, of the five, uh, or the themes that I gave you of those five books of the, of the poetic collection. Now, the Psalms have been collected in various, as you, can, as you can probably see if you examine it very closely. It's not only one big collection, but it's a series of smaller collections. And in fact, in your Bible, uh, most of the modern translations of the Bible or versions of the Bible will have, uh, have it divided into five books. And book one, uh, which is Psalms 1 through 41. We'll talk about that in a minute. But who wrote the Psalms? Well, we think they're the Psalms of David, but David didn't write all of them. In fact, he only wrote a little less than half of them. Uh, David wrote about 73 of the Psalms. I wish I could take some time to get into the inscriptions to the Psalms because the inscriptions to the Psalms are quite old. In fact, when the writers, uh, when the scholars who translated the Hebrew Bible into the Septuagint, the Greek version, back in the 4th century B.C., uh, or 3rd century B.C., uh, those inscriptions on the Psalms were there then, and they didn't know then how they got there. So they're quite old uh, and could be part of the text uh, as far as we're concerned. Uh, we have a course in that in which we teach something more about uh, the scholarship and the technical apparatus that, that tries to understand that. Uh, I might just say one thing here, and that is that some of those inscriptions, instead of going with the psalm that follows, should go with the psalm that precedes it. And that clears up some things uh, if you get into real study of it. Now, I said that 73 of the psalms were written by David. Twelve of them are inscribed to Asaph, who was one of the chief singers. In fact, he was one of the ones that was involved with David in bringing the ark back from the house of Obed-Edom up into Jerusalem. He was involved in that, and his whole family uh, were singers and musicians. In fact, many of you know that I was involved in music over in, in Mobile, the Mobile Church, for a number of years, and uh, there were several people that referred to us as the family of Asaph, uh, because all of our family was involved in music and, and serving in the church one way or another. Now, 11 of them were written by the sons of Korah, other Levites. Fifty of them are anonymous. We don't know who wrote them. I have some ideas about some of them. And one of the Psalms is attributed to Moses. Now, I mentioned that there's been several collections of these Psalms. Uh, Solomon collected a number of them. Hezekiah collected a number of them. And Ezra and Nehemiah made collections of them. And so this would, just by the very people that we talked about there, this would make the Psalms some 500 years in gathering. Now, it's been observed that there's a sort of a poetic Pentateuch about these five books of the Psalms that I mentioned. And so we're going to put a visual or a little uh, outline on the screen up here just to show you how these five uh, could actually be involved there. Now, the first section of them are Davidic Psalms, and they might be like Genesis because the man and man's uh, problems, man's uh, praise, man's whatever, 
Uh, it's, a lot of it is addressed to man. And so the emphasis there in the first 41 chapters is on man. The second uh, book of the Psalms or collections, 42 through 72, might be analogous to Exodus because there's a lot in there about deliverance uh, over and over, over and over and over. In those passages right there, you, you hear that. I'll just take a few right here. Uh, uh, Psalm 43, vindicate me, O God, and please my cause against an ungodly nation. Um, redemption in Psalm 44. Uh, Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Uh, and then on through there, have mercy, O God, Psalm 51. Uh, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Save me, O God, by your name. Give ear to my prayer, O God, and do not hide, Psalm 55. Psalm 56, be merciful to me, O God. That begins a lot of psalms in this. So it's a plea and a cry for deliverance. Now the third major uh, segment of this uh, of books, uh, collection of books, 73 through 89, written uh, mostly by Asaph, could be analogous to Leviticus because a lot is said there about the sanctuary. I was glad when they said unto me, let us come into the house of the Lord. And the fourth uh, collection of these, who mostly are anonymous, uh, could be analogous to numbers because it talks about the cessation of wandering and how they came through all of the vicissitudes and, and, and it has some things that are veiled references to the kingdom of God or coming under the rule of God and coming in some order in their lives. And then the fifth segment of the Psalms or book of the Psalms is 107 through 150 and they're made up of the Davidic Psalms and some anonymous. And uh, these could be called or analogous to Deuteronomy, which is a thanksgiving for the faithfulness of God, a review of the faithfulness of God. And then, of course, when you review the faithfulness and the grace of God, the whole of the, of the book and of that last five things winds up, the last five chapters of the Psalms wind up being great hymns of praise unto God. Now, uh, let me just point up a few smaller collections, different kinds of collections that are specific uh, for specific purposes in the Psalms. And there's just two I want to refer to because that's about all we have time for. And I'm just going to touch on the Song of Solomon uh, in this section. And one of these uh, smaller collections of Psalms is this, what we call the song, Songs of Degrees. And they are Psalm 120 through 134. Uh, some Bibles over each one of them call them uh, songs or psalms of ascent, A-S-C-E-N-T, which means a going up. Now, there have been various interpretations. Some of the rabbis, the Jewish rabbis in times past, regarded these 15 psalms as songs on the 15 steps of the temple. Now, the only problem with that is there's never been any way to prove that there were 15 steps to the temple. We don't know how many steps there were to the temple. Uh, some of them uh, take the position that they're songs of ascents, uh, that it's a going up. And part of one view is that these are progressive uh, parallelisms uh, that develop within the thought and the concepts involved in the songs. That's a little technical, and it seems like it doesn't accomplish a whole lot. There are a lot of others who feel like that these were uh, stages or psalms that were sung along the way as the Jews went to the various uh, the main feast days going on to the Day of Atonement and various other times in the Hebrew year. And uh, one very excellent uh, treatment of that, and I see no reason why they couldn't have been used for that, although as we will see, uh, this was not the original use of it. But I have a book here that uh, you may have be familiar with, but it's an excellent treatment or meditations on these 15 Psalms. And I have found these to be uh, very helpful to me personally uh, in my devotional life. Uh, and they're called a Songs of Degrees by Stephen Kong. Uh, I think he was one of the ones that came that was associated with Watchman Nee and the work in China for a number of years, but who's ministered in this country for a long time. Uh, this is um, published by Christian Fellowship Publishers uh, in New York. And it's just an excellent book. I find it excellent for, uh, for my own devotional life. Now, what do we mean then? What is the interpretation of these songs and degrees? What degrees? Well, actually, the Hebrew there says, the article is before it, it says it's the song of the degrees. 
a song of the degrees. Now, the only degrees that the Bible talks about in just this fashion, you will recall in Chronicles and in Isaiah, the story of King Hezekiah, uh, who was about to die, and he prayed to God that he would give him more time, and the sundial in the garden of the king went backwards uh, some 15 or, or some uh, 15 or 10 degrees representing 15 years uh, of a man's span of life. Uh, now, you say, well, if, it's, uh, if these are 15 songs, well, what about the 10 degrees? Why were there only 10 degrees? Well, we believe that, uh, that he wrote 10. And it's interesting that in this grouping right here, that five of them are anonymous, or excuse me, ten of them are anonymous. The other five are attributed either to David or Solomon. And so we know that Hezekiah wrote Psalms, and I want to propose that these ten are, because they are the songs of degrees, that these are the ones that Hezekiah, you'll remember Hezekiah, very spiritual man, very spiritual king. Uh, he restored temple worship in a time when it had been out of commission for many years. We know that he was a composer of, of songs. And in fact, in Isaiah chapter 38, where it tells the story of his being granted these 15 years extra of life, uh, represented symbolically by the 10 degrees on the, uh, on the uh, sundial there, that in verse 20 he mentions some songs. He's called them my songs that he wrote uh, to, to praise the Lord with. And uh, literally in Hebrew this means a set of songs. And uh, what better place to find them than in these ten? Now, I think, it's a, uh, I think it's an interesting arrangement, too, because these 15 uh, psalms are arranged in five groups of three. And every one of the three, let me just put something on the board here to, uh, to give you kind of a little outline of it there. Uh, in each group of three, you have two, uh, two by Hezekiah, call him Hez here, and one by either David or Solomon in each group of three, all the way through the 15. And if you take these three in each little group like this, you'll find that the first one in each group talks about trouble, the second one talks about trust, and the third one talks about triumph in each group of, of three through the five sets of three. Uh, and so I believe that's what the Psalms of Degrees are. They may have had other usages, uh, the liturgical uses, in, in some years after that, but I believe that's what it was. Now, let's take a look at the Messianic Psalms and what little bit of time we have left, because I think these are greatly important. And these are also called prophetic Psalms because they, they prophesy a coming Redeemer, a, a coming Messiah. And there are three themes to these prophetic psalms or the psalms that have to do with the prophesying about the Messiah. The first theme is the humiliation and exaltation of this Messiah. So that's the first one. Let me say that again because you'll need to fill in the blanks in your workbook there on this matter. The humiliation and the exaltation of the Messiah. That's one theme. Uh, a second theme in these Messianic Psalms is the sorrows and the eventual deliverance of Israel. Let me say that again. The sorrows and the eventual deliverance of Israel. Now the third theme is the future blessing of all nations through Israel's reigning Messiah. And so that is the, uh, those are the three themes that you see throughout all of these Psalms. Now, the principal messianic psalms, and you've got those on your notes there, but I'll just run through them quickly, are Psalm 2, 8, 16, 22, 23, 24, 40, 41, 56, 68, 69, 72, 87, 89, uh, and then dropping back to 52, 60, and 68. Now these psalms refer to his birth, his betrayal, his agony, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, his coming again in glory, and his worldwide reign. So you really cover the whole of the ministry of Jesus in these Psalms. In fact, there are more Messianic uh, uh, references 
in the Psalms than there are in Isaiah with all of those wonderful things. Uh, let's just touch on Psalm 22 as one of these Messianic Psalms. Um, I've always, since I first heard about this, I've always had, uh, I've marveled at this psalm. It starts out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where does that come from? Right off the cross, you see. Uh, I am a worm, no man, a reproach of men, despised of my people. All those who see me laugh to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, he trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. And that was all going on even around the cross right there. Uh, verse 14, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up as a potsherd. My tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. Down in verse 18, 17 and 18, I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Imagine that. You know, possibly uh, 900 years or better before Christ actually hung on a cross and died there. Well, that's just one of those Messianic Psalms. It's a marvelous uh, study to look at those and to see how much of the very life and death and glory of Jesus Christ was spelled out in those Psalms. Now, we're just going to finish up with just a, a bare reference to the Song of Solomon. Um, there's, there's not a lot of of organization to it so we can't approach it necessarily that way because it is such an allegorical poem. Uh, there have been several theories about it. A naturalistic theory is that this is just an erotic love song and we hear this sometimes when people, uh, Christians in local communities get involved in uh, anti-pornographic campaigns then uh, these sinners out there who have read just enough of the Bible to get them in trouble uh, always throw back in your face, well, there's a lot of pornography in the Bible. And when they say that, generally, they're referring to the Song of Solomon. But that's a naturalistic theory of interpretation. Uh, there is an allegorical theory. And this is one that, throughout the history of the church, uh, it was quite active in Alexandria during the uh, pre-Christian uh, uh, era uh, among Jews there. Uh, there was extreme fantasy and fi fiction and just all kind of mystical meanings that came out of this thing. But I think most of the Christian church today has settled on what we may call a typical uh, interpretation or a typical theory of the Song of Solomon. And it is referred to by those kinds of interpreters as a royal marriage hymn in which Solomon is seen as a type of Christ and his bride uh, being the church or the people of God. Now, of course, the Jews, when they read it, didn't see the church in that, but they saw somehow a coming together of Almighty God, the, 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 the almightiness of God, and the people of God. And so I think there are two themes that run through, or two levels of interpretation. You know, we've talked about the various levels of interpretation before. I think there are two levels of interpretation to the Song of Solomon. Number one is that it is a parable of sanctified love, love that is in sanctified uh, holy surroundings, and we don't need to be ashamed of it. Uh, we don't need to be in the common cast of puritanical, although I don't like to use that word because the Puritans were not what a lot of uh, secular people have represented them to be. Nevertheless, uh, the idea that sex is just purely for procreation or anything like that uh, that whole thing is knocked out the window by a reading of the Song of Solomon. It, it sanctifies uh, that kind of, of love in marriage. Now, another thing on a higher level, I think, is that it represents the union of Christ with the church at that great marriage feast of the Lamb. And I think if you look at that and read it on those two levels like that, you'll get a lot out of it. And you'll have to see it, just as a little guide to interpretation, as a collection of idols, I-D-Y-L-L-S, which means a collection of pictures. You've got a little picture here, and then a vignette here, then a picture here. And if you see those, and there are a number of good books on the market, just be careful about those that get too fanciful. But if they stick in the main to this as a sanctified love, and it's also symbolic of the, rep of the union of Christ and His church, then you can't go too far wrong on that. 
All right, let's close out this session then as we bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for the word. We thank you for the word that represents so much of our own personal experience with life and with you. Help us to understand it. Help us to understand you. And Father, I pray that our hearts may grow more and more in love with you. I pray that we shall seek you out early and late. May we pant after you like the heart panteth after the water brooks. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're going to turn our attention to the other body of material in the poetic literature, which we shall call as a unit the wisdom literature, as opposed to the kind of material that's in Psalms and in Song of Solomon. You know, the bulk of the Old Testament is very direct. It calls us to obey and to believe, or to believe and obey, however you want to look at it. But wisdom calls us to do several other things. And... Uh, I'm going to give you four things that wisdom literature calls upon us to do. Number one, wisdom literature calls upon us to think hard and humbly. Now, we've been commanded to do some other things earlier, but now it's time to, to think, and to think humbly, not just arrogantly. The second thing that wisdom literature asks us to do is to keep our eyes open, and not to be foolish. But keep your eyes open in life. Uh, don't go around with your head in the clouds, so to speak. Now, another thing that wisdom literature wants us to do is to use our conscience and our common sense. Uh, we don't use that enough. Sometimes I think once we get saved and get filled with the Spirit, we kind of think we're going to be directed by divine fiat all the time. Uh, that's special for us. But it's there in the Word, and we've got to be careful about it. Now, the fourth thing that wisdom tells us to do is not to shirk the most disturbing questions. And this is very important to me. I guess most of my, my life I've not been able to live comfortably with questions that disturb. I don't want to put those aside. A lot, a lot of times as Christians uh, we want to just deal with the positive and we don't want to deal with what's negative. But if it's there and if it's true, we need to deal with it or to confront it. So we need to stop in the from our fast travels through history now and begin to think and to ponder on what we have learned. And the wisdom literature is above all that. It's a pondering on not just things that have happened, but why they have happened, why they've happened the way they have, and what is the outcome or what is the prognosis of our present situation. Now, of course, as we said, calling it wisdom literature means that what wisdom are we talking about? Well, we're talking about God's wisdom. And the position of this literature is that God's wisdom is, is echoed everywhere. It's seen everywhere in the heavens and in the earth, except where the arrogance and the rebellion of man has disagreed with what God has presented as the truth about things. And everywhere man has disagreed with the godly wisdom or the godly knowledge of things uh, and what's behind things, uh, in every one of these areas, in culture, in the earth, uh, in everything that we have to do with, uh, we've gone downhill and we've, we've gone to disaster. And over and over in these books, there's a single theme, and that is that there's a single, simple system in the universe. And if you're going to understand it, uh, a spirit of humility is necessary. Now, here are some of the aspects of that simple wisdom. Number one, that God, by wisdom, founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. And we see this in that couplet in Proverbs 3.19. Another passage out of the Psalms, 115.3, Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. He's not made up of a lot of different cosmic forces at war against one another with an uncertain outcome. God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Another thing that comes out of this body of literature is that the creation of God, it coheres, it holds together, it's sensible. And we are invited to relate to the whole of God's creation. 
And everything that God has created is important and it has purpose. Now, this idea influences radically two modern tendencies. We have two tendencies, modern, and as far as Christians or as religious people, we tend to a kind of exclusive pietism. We'd like to shut God in to our narrow concerns within the church or within this religious organization and say this is where God is. Now, uh, the obverse of that or the, the other side of that is that in the world there is a tendency towards absolute secular autonomy for human culture. In other words, they like to shut God out of 90% of the endeavors of mankind so that He has no input into these realms. And on the other hand, we Christians, we won't let them do that. We say, well, we'll just take care of ours. But we need to affect society. And wisdom literature tells you how to interact out there in the world. Now, the root of all, or the verse I say that expresses the root and the dynamic of all of the wisdom literature, of course, is found uh, there in it. The fear of the Lord is the beginning or the first principle of wisdom. Let me say that again. The fear of the Lord is the beginning or the first principle of wisdom. Now, this is not an abject fear. This is not a trembling fear, uh, debilitating fear. It is that awe and that respect for the majesty of God because He created all things by the word of His power and He sustains all things by the word of His power. Now, when you bear in mind the fear of God, then it keeps the shrewdness of Proverbs from slipping into just mere self-interest. You know, if you read Proverbs, uh, some of those fellows are pretty sharp. And if you just deal and use those Proverbs as a means of getting your own way, then it can, uh, it can degenerate into a series of manipulative uh, means or methods. But in the fear of God, you don't manipulate to get what you, what you want. That's witchcraft, to try to influence other people to do what you want or to meet your own needs. But in the fear of God, you will begin to see that there's tremendous principles there. Now, the fear of God also keeps the perplexities in Job from turning to outright mutiny. It's the fear of God. We're held by the awe that we have of God. And also this fear of God keeps the disillusionment of Ecclesiastes from a final despair that could only end in self-destruction. All right, so much for the wisdom literature as a whole. And I want to, uh, I've got a book on this that you might be interested in. It's a recently written book. And I've got a tremendous amount of uh, pleasure out of the reading of this book. It's not very expensive. But uh, this is the, it's published by uh, InterVarsity Press by uh, Derek Kidner. And the, uh, in fact, the under title there, the subtitle is The Fear of the Lord uh, is the Beginning of Wisdom. The Wisdom of Proverbs, Job, and Ecclesiastes. Uh, it's an excellent little book. And I recommend it high, highly. Some of the material that I'm using in this lecture has come out of this. Now, <clears throat> let's go to Proverbs now. And we'll call Proverbs, as a subtitle, A Life Well Managed. Let me say that again. Proverbs, A Life Well Managed. How many of you would like to have a well-managed life? Well, the book of Proverbs gives us the principles of that sort of thing. Let's go to an outline of Proverbs. Uh, there are a number of them, and of course, Proverbs doesn't yield itself, like much of the wisdom literature, to a very uh, structured outline because it's kind of a flow, but I believe there's one here, and this is the one that I like. Uh, the first section, the first nine chapters, is a fatherly approach. This is exhortations for the young. Second section, lasting about 12 chapters, is a plain man's Approach these short sentence sayings. This is where we generally think of Proverbs, you know, a stitch in time saves nine, or those are not Proverbs, of course, but that's the style of thing we think of when we think of Proverbs. A third section, which is involved in chapters 22, verse 17, through the end of chapter 24, would be more fatherly teachings, and this is divided into two groups. There's a larger group and there's a shorter group. And then the fourth section, uh, chapters 25 through 29, would be more sentence sayings, and these are gleanings from Solomon as they were compiled by Hezekiah in his time. Then a, four, a fifth 
uh, category or section is just chapter 30, which is an observer's approach. There's a musings on the hidden creator and the strange actings of his creatures. And then finally, that famous chapter on the ideal woman, uh, chapter 31, a womanly approach. Uh, the first section of it is a mother's home truths, first nine verses, and a wife's example, uh, verses 10 through 31. Now, we're not going to go through all of this, but we're going to take a look at section one, the fatherly approach. And I think this is a good place to begin Proverbs. If you were thrown right into the middle of the book where all of those little short, pithy sayings uh, that are all broken up and don't seem to have much continuity or much plot to them, kind of reminds me of the fellow that spent the winter in the Yukon in a cabin by himself and all he had was the Encyclopedia Britannica. And when he came out in the spring, they asked him, how was his winter? And, and he mentioned that he'd been reading the Encyclopedia Britannica. And they said, well, how was it? Well, he said, uh, uh, the description was fine, but the plot was kind of jumpy. So uh, uh, using that as an approach to Proverbs, it's a little difficult to get into these sayings that just jump from one thing that don't seem to have much connection. But there is a connection in this early part, the fatherly approach. This is a good way to get in to the book. And the wisdom that's given there and throughout Proverbs is a kind of wisdom that must engage the whole man, all of his interest, not just his religious interest, but especially his relationship with God, and they see it as having to do with all of his other social, uh, political, whatever kinds of relationships. Now, this wisdom emphasizes several things. One of the things that it emphasizes in this first nine uh, chapters right here is it emphasizes old-fashioned virtue and family life. It extols the goodness of family life. Now, in the course of this, after having dealt with it for several chapters, it comes upon uh, two dangers to family life. There are two dangers that are mentioned here. The first one is the fatal appeal of the gang to the restlessness of youth. <laughs> now, I've used modern terminology, uh, but the gang is an is a important and a dangerous phenomenon in many of our large cities. But Solomon... Uh, wrote about it quite early in his advice to fathers and extolling the family as over against these other uh, groupings or corporate groupings that try to bring commitment and a sense of family apart from the real family. The tragedy of our cities and of our culture today is we have substituted all kinds of other relationships, these close-knit relationships, for the family relationship. And uh, the peer pressure that's in school is against the family. Very early on, children learn that parents are the enemy and uh, their friends are their family. And that's backwards. And the proverb speaks especially to this. Now, the other threat, you will remember, is that subtle threat of sexual temptations. And it talks about how this is personified in this woman, this loose woman who lives in a house on the corner and she's always after them, so they have to be very careful. You wonder why they spend so much time doing that. Uh, I remember a number of years ago, we were on a bike trip with a number of men that were related to me or that I was trying to pastor. And it was a long trip. It was from uh, Nashville, Tennessee, down to Natchez, uh, Mississippi, down the Trace, uh, as much of the Trace as we could find that was complete. And uh, we were, of course, having our morning devotions, reading the Proverbs, and it just so happened that we... Uh, uh, that the, we were, uh, it was the 4th of the month, I think. I think it was the 4th of June uh, or something like that. Uh, let's see. Yeah, no, the 5th, 5th. And uh, this, and so we got together to read, and here's men, you know, they're all ministers and whatsoever like that, and this happened to be the day for this one, you know. My son, pay attention to my wisdom, for the lips of an MR woman drip honey in her mouth. So I went on that morning. It wasn't very, uh, wasn't very helpful to us at that morning. Uh, to move through that, but I just happen to remember that uh, just at this time, uh, that sometimes that may, that may seem a little bit out of place. Uh, I'd hate to think that it had any relevance, relevance to that group or particularly at that time. But he deals with that as a threat to the home. Now, as you go on through this first section, as we said through chapter 9, then he winds up with a tremendous hymn of praise to wisdom in chapter 8, and chapter 9. And 
it's a very good uh, interpretive device to see wisdom as the Lord Jesus Christ. He is wisdom personified. He is the wisdom of God in symbol there. And it's the very principle of all creation is what he winds up saying. Now you can go on and you can, of course, many of you read these Psalms devotionally or these Proverbs devotionally. And that's about all that we need to say about these other than just to give you some kind of an outline there. I'd like to spend a little bit more time in the book of Job and then in Ecclesiastes now. Let's go on to the book of Job. If we have said that uh, Proverbs is a life well managed, then the book of Job could be said to be the title of it or the theme of it, a world well managed. But we're going to put a question mark at the end of it because the implicit question as we delve into Job is that men are always inclined, and Job and his friends are no exception, to wonder whether or not the world is being well managed. Have you ever wondered that? Have you ever wondered whether your part of it was well managed? You know, we like to think that somebody is in control. And I think one of the frightful things about our present culture is that, politically speaking, we're not sure that anybody is in control. Congress seems to vote whatever seems to, uh, you know, meet their own, the needs of their own constituencies and, uh, or their own personal needs. In fact, it seems like to me that most of what Congress does and congressmen do is designed to get them reelected, not to uh, really can be concerned with the, with the matters that are of concern to me or concern to the, to the electorate out there. Presidents are, are of course, uh, prey to a lot of different political pressures and, and just uh, secular humanistic uh, problems and, and pressures there. So is the world well managed is a question that we go into Job with. And instead of being reminded of our ignorance, as Proverbs does so often, we are faced with the urgent problem of divine justice. Is there divine justice in the earth? This was a question the Jews faced throughout their history. After all, they were the people of God. They were the chosen of God. And throughout their history, they have been subjected to horrendous uh, circumstances. Uh, to, the, to the point uh, that at the end of the Old Testament period, they entered into that 400 years of darkness, despairing that, ever, that there ever was going to be any justice for them on the earth. And so there arose a body of what we have referred to as apocalyptic literature, which threw any hope of justice or retribution or a balancing of the scales on out way into the future in some kind of mystical never-never land. And so there are really two questions here that arise out of this. First, is there any such thing on the human scene as disinterested virtue? Is there any such thing on the human scene as disinterested virtue? Is there anybody that is virtuous just to be virtuous? To put it another way, and this gets us into the book, does God's finest servant, Job, does he serve him for conscience? or for convenience. And this is where the story picks up because the Satan, and in the, the, the Hebrew uses the article there, accuses God, or accuses Job before God of just serving him because after all he had a pretty good deal. He had a good life. He had a lot of benefits out of it. Now to give an outline of the book, and we'll bring this up on the screen, there are really just three main sections of the book. There's only one main section a poetic dialogue that's framed on either side by two, uh, two prose, uh, a prologue and an epilogue. Of course, chapter 1 and 2, we have Satan's cynical taunt of Job before God and saying, yeah, I, don't, I don't understand why he's such a good man. You say he is because there's nothing happened to him. Kind of makes us wonder, you know, uh, if people speak well of us and how great we are and everything like that, watch out. <laughs> uh, the devil may hear that. So I don't want to keep a very high profile about any righteousness that I have or any goodness. I want to just keep saying I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I'm reminded of a man a number of years ago uh, who was owned uh, several oil companies uh, that delivered oil and everything like that. And he was a hard worker and, and very often he would drive one of the trucks. And uh, he didn't want anybody to think. He was one of the kind of men that tried to hide his uh, riches or if he had any uh, whatever he had. <laughs> 
And uh, he just gave the impression of being one of the good old boys, you know. And uh, so uh, when his wife was in the hospital one time, they went up there, you know, and uh, they were talking about, uh, you know, extensive kinds of stuff, you know, and he was wondering about that. And he said, man, I'm just a truck driver. Well, he was a millionaire several times over and just seemed to like to keep up with that, but he wanted to keep a low profile. I had a member of a church one time that owned most of a large city, a fairly good-sized city in southern Kentucky, and, uh, or his family did, and he did. But he went around in old clothes and delighted to go to Florida during the wintertime and just kind of sit on a porch and chew on a weed and whittle and wear old clothes and just kind of listen to people. You know, you'd never know by looking at him that he had any... Uh, well, he just wanted to keep out of trouble. These men do. They don't want to draw attention to that. And uh, so when you read the book of Job, you don't, want to, you don't want to say, or you don't want anybody to say about you, oh, how, how holy you are, how great you are, how perfect you are, because it might attract the same attention that Job did, and I'm sure none of us wants that. Now, in the second, which is the major portion of this, this is that poetic dialogue, which is composed of a number of rounds, uh, of speeches by Job's three friends. And uh, this is composed of really three main sections. You've got the sufferer's outrage, and that's Job. He comes and speaks every now and then. He's outraged. And then the moralist's bias. His friends were the moralists. They're always trying to press their moralism upon him. And they're biased that way. They can't see anything else. And then, of course, the Lord's high wisdom, which begins in chapter 38 uh, and 39. So these are the three elements of this whole, uh, to make some sense out of it. You can break it all down in various cycles of sayings, but I think that's the main thing. You've got Job's outrage. You've got the moralist bias and their, uh, their religiosity, and you've got God's answer or his high wisdom. I shouldn't say answer. It's just his high wisdom. We'll see that in a moment. Now, the last thing, of course, is the, is the prose epilogue where Job is vindicated and restored, again, starting in chapter 42, verse 7. Now, in the prologue, let's take that for a moment. We'll deal with each one of these sections and get some real meat and sense out of them. Let's take the prologue, the prose prologue. Now, in that, there are about three matters that are dealt with, three or four matters we'll talk about here. Number one, the question of suffering and sin. Now, one of the things we pick up immediately is that suffering does not necessarily imply guilt on your part or failure. You need to know that. I think sometimes in the impact of the faith teaching, we must get the idea that either if we're not healed or we're not this or we're not that, then we must be people of little faith or we must have done something pretty terrible. And Satan wants to give that impression. But it's very clear that Job did not suffer uh, because of guilt or because of failure in the sense that Satan was trying to say. In fact, it was his very innocence that exposed him to this ordeal. You can imagine God is not about to expose some fellow who has trouble with all of these areas to this kind of pressure. And the third thing that I want to say about suffering and sin, and this was said by uh, one of the great scholars, he said that Job was not so much abandoned by God as he was honored by God. And that may seem, let me say that again. I want you to hear that and remember that. That Job was not so much abandoned by God as he was honored by God. Now, I, I recall also the humorous little uh, episode in the barnyard there in uh, Fiddler on the Roof when the father, Tevi, I think that was his name, he looked up to heaven one time. He was going through a very difficult time, and he looked up and he said, I know we're your chosen people, but couldn't you just choose somebody else for a while? Well, I think everybody that's tried to walk close to God and feels like they're the called of God, in particular if you've tried to minister for God at God's direction, You've come on to some uh, circumstances that have afflicted you and, and pressed you down, and you've wondered, you know, what in the world is going on? And, and many have been tempted to say, well, man, if this is what service for God or trying to follow God brings, you know, let me try something else. And there was a period of time in my life when I tried something else, but uh, that didn't work. I was ruined. <laughs> I wasn't comfortable being just a plain, ordinary person any more than I was comfortable being a sinner uh, because I had heard the call of God. And I think this is one of the things that held Job throughout all this. Now, a second issue in the prologue that's dealt with these first two chapters is a matter of the accuser. And he is presented here 
in a very uh, narrative sort of a fashion, a, a pic pictorial image of him that's very interesting. Uh, I've already mentioned that in the Hebrew text uh, that the word is Satan or the Satan, the accuser, uh, instead of, uh, that's interesting from a point of view of uh, the usage of it in the Muslim religion. Uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, what is it, the uh, Ira Iranians under the leadership of uh, the recently uh, died, the, their leader, called the United States under his direction the great Satan. So it's a, it's a Semitic characteristic of calling him the Satan, or which means the adversary. Now Satan's attempts here as the accuser are to prove that man is a hypocrite, and in particular that Job is. And if he can prove that Job is a hypocrite, that he only serves God before he can get out of it, then nobody's sincerity will be credible from now on. So Job did a marvelous thing for us. It showed that when things get really bad, there is something that comes from God that will hold you, and you won't be proven uh, to be an evil person or an insincere person. Now, another thing that I want to point out about the adversary as, he, as his character develops in particular as it's seen in the prologue, is that the core of his interaction was his cynicism. I'm persuaded to believe that cynicism is straight from the devil, and it will kill whatever God's trying to do. Is it, it is an adversative against whatever God's trying to do. Now the third issue that I want to point out uh, uh, that takes place or that is introduced in the prologue is the matter of divine permission. That it looks as if uh, the devil is given permission. Now, one of the things I want to point out here is that this is not an isolated, unique case. A lot of people would like to make that, and I would like to, too. I'd like to think that this kind of thing, that, that a, a godly man like Job could only be turned over to uh, Satan uh, because of some unique, unfathomable, sovereign uh, plan or will of God. But the truth of the matter is this is God's chosen way to deal with evil. It's seen over and over in the Scriptures, which means that you could come into this same kind of a situation. And so there are about four statements that we could make about this uh, God's way of dealing with evil. He's chosen not to crush it at the outside, but to wrestle with it. Jesus wrestling with it in the wilderness uh, is a good sign of that. And He's chosen secondarily, as with respect to evil, to deal with it in weakness and not in strength. Jesus came into that uh, wrestling with Satan there after 40 days of fasting. Uh, a number of instances where when we're weak, we're strong, Paul says. Now, thirdly, in God's dealing with evil, He's chosen to do it through men, or rather through outright miracles from heaven. You might say, well, sometimes He does it through men miraculously. Well, that's true. God is going to wrestle. And God has chosen us. Sometimes we ourselves, the people of God or the person of God, is a divine uh, warf uh, warfare that's going on our field. Now, God also deals with evil through costly permissions rather than flat denials. And in this is the case in Job. God permitted Job, or de the devil to afflict Job. But I want you to understand the second thing, that it was permission and not abdication. God didn't walk off and turn his back. He said, this far you shall you go, and you won't go any further. You need to know that. And what Paul says in Corinthians is that when that happens, is that there will not be too much put on you that you can't bear it, because God's going to give you even the means to bear it. Now, this whole matter of divine permission, or, or how do we explain what's happened to a godly man, was as unfathomable to us as it was to Job and his friends. Does God really do this? Well, Jesus looked at Simon one time. He said, Simon, Simon, take heed. Say, Satan has been given leave to sift you like wheat. That's interesting. I recall to your mind that we're not saved from the fiery furnace, but what? We're saved in the fiery furnace. And I think we have to, in any dealing with about how God interacts with evil in us, I think we have to go back to Luke 22:53. Or Jesus, looking at the crowd in the garden who'd come to take him, he said, This is your hour and the power of darkness. 
indicating that power had been given to them to do certain things. And any thinking about suffering and evil has got to take into account what happened to the Lord in just that way. I heard the story one time of a man who had recently lost his son and it was under tragic circumstances and, and he was bemoaning all of this and, and uh, uh, really not thinking well of God and happened to make an outburst to a minister who was standing near and said, uh, where was God when my son died? And the minister looked at him. He said he was right where he was when his son died at the cross. And that's true. We shouldn't take the cross lightly. We've tried to bypass it, I think, a lot of times in the charismatic movement. But we don't hear much about the cross. We don't hear much about the way of the cross. We hear, don't hear much about the dark night of the soul. By the way, the book that I just mentioned, uh, about Steve, written by Stephen Kong on the degrees, uh, the Psalms of degrees there, uh, speaks a good bit about how to deal with that so-called dark night of the soul. Now, taking the second section, which is the longer section, there's a lot of voices here in dialogue. And you have Job's friends. And I don't want to dismiss them lightly. I don't want to say that they were just all dumb heads and, you know, and just missed it. Uh, but they, they, they had good intentions, and they spoke well at times. But there were three basic errors that they fell into, and I want to give you those. These are the errors of Job's friends. Number one as many people do, they overestimated their grasp of the truth. Let me say that again. They overestimated their grasp of the truth. Secondly, like so many people do, they misapplied the truth they did know. You remember the prophet Agabus who had a real word from God about Paul when they met there and he was, Paul was on his way to Jerusalem and he bound him with a girdle and he said, uh, he said persecution awaits him who wears this. And uh, that was right. But then he said, don't go. And Paul said, wait a minute, I'm ready to go. And that's the plan of God that I go. And thirdly, these men, not only did they overestimate their grasp of truth, not only did they misapply what they knew, but in the final analysis, they closed their minds to any facts that might contradict what they had assumed in their neat little package of truth. Now, one lesson that we might learn out of this is that God, when we begin to see, when God began to respond a little bit later on to what they said, God doesn't want anybody applying or trying to help people understand what He means. If you ever, you have any friends who, you, you'll say something in a, in a social conversation like that and somebody say, well, what He means is this. I don't want anybody to tell me what I mean. I'll tell you what I, what I mean. But there are always people that are trying to tell you what God means uh, like this uh, who are not even sure of it themselves. Now, a, another lesson that they needed to learn is that the promises of God have a not yet as well as a now. A lot of the faith teaching is that everything's got to be now. That God wants to heal everybody now. And that God will heal everybody now. God will give everybody this, that. It's just a matter of, you pick the time. Well, our times are not ours. They're in the hands of God. And in the promises of God, there is a now, but there's also a not yet. That's true of our very salvation. There is a now of salvation. There is a continuingness of salvation, but there's a not yet of salvation. And Paul said, your salvation now is your salvation nearer than when you first believed. So it's still out there. Now let's take a look at Job himself in this dialogue. It's very clear he feels like he's attacked by his friends on one hand and by God on the other, or at least neglected by God. And uh, it's sort of between the devil and the deep blue sea. I don't know where that, if that uh, phrase originated in, in some of these teachings or not, but that's bad. And he, and he felt estranged from God, and that's the worst part. There was a silence from God, and um, that is very difficult to take. I, we've been through times like that in our own life where uh, God just uh, doesn't seem to be saying anything. Well, let me say something I think that's significant here, and that is, as we observe Job as he goes through this, the deeper his darkness grew, the more his grip tightened on what he has always stood for. You know, this is a season of, uh, we're talking right now in, uh, going into mid-March of 1990, and uh, this is the time of March Madness and all of the tournaments and everything. And I hear this kind of advice coming from coaches, or this is standard advice that coaches give their team or, or coaches are supposed to receive, is don't change your whole game plan uh, when you get here. Do what got you there. 
And as long as you're a Christian and you've been following God, unless the Holy Spirit... Re just keep on keeping on. When it gets dark, don't try to change everything around you. Let God do the changing. You hold on. Hold on. Stand firm where you've been and what you are, what you know. And God, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Now, I want to make another observation here, and that is that there had to be great obscurity of the purposes of God. There really had to be a spiritual darkness in order for this test to be true. And I don't know whether you thought of it that way or not, but whenever you're going through a test, it has to be pretty deep. But remember that God's got a hold of you, and there's vindication and blessing on the other side. But it's got to be dark. And sometimes, according to what God is planning for you out there, it has to be very dark. And then when out of this darkness and this dark night of the soul comes the greatest saying in the book, it comes right from divine revelation. I think uh, we must understand that as far as the Hebrew faith was concerned, there wasn't a lot known about personal survival after death. In fact, that wasn't even a consideration. But out of this darkness and out of this ignorance comes this statement, for I know that my Redeemer lives and at last will stand upon the earth and after my flesh has thus been destroyed, then from my flesh I shall see God. Marvelous. A word of grace that came right from God. Nobody else knew that. Nobody else even thought that. So it came right from God. Now, <clears throat> we've talked about the three friends and their dialogue. We've talked about what Job had to say. And we're going to talk about what the Lord's answer is. But before we get there, there's just a little bit of interlude here from Elihu. <clears throat> and there's only three things we can say about it. That it delayed the final denouement or the ending of this thing that's going to come up shortly. But in the end, what Elihu had to say was ignored by God. Just ignored. That's ignominious. <laughs> I'd rather God beat it down sometimes than just ignore it. But he just ignored it. When he began talking, he didn't act like he'd ever said anything. Which has led some scholars to believe that this is an additive thing, but I think not. I think God wants to answer some things, other things. He doesn't, not even, not even in the ballpark. Might as well just, just forget it. <clears throat> now, he does seem to have some point in dealing with the fact that suffering has an education, educative uh, kind of uh, effect, and it has a cleansing effect. But he didn't realize that Job was suffering for an entirely different set of reasons. Don't think that the suffering you go through is just merely to educate you or to cleanse you, although it may be to do both. There may be a higher purpose in God in His sovereign will. Now, the Lord's answer. There are three things or four things I think I want to point out in the Lord's answer right here as we're kind of just making this survey. First is that God changed the subject. Not only have they been using the wrong answers, but they had not even been asking the right questions. So God starts off in another, another vein altogether. And secondly, in his answer, God is enlarging Job's horizons. He takes him from his little miserable ash heap, sitting there bowed over and concerned about himself and the opprobrium of his friends, and God raises him up to the top of the universe and allows him to see what he sees. A third thing that I want to say about the Lord's answer is there's not anything really soothing or explanatory in these chapters where God makes his answer. God doesn't deign really to answer that. But he raises Job somewhere else and places him on a different level. Uh, I think it's passing strange that in this answer, God starts out with the magnificence and praise of the cosmos. And he winds up with an extraordinary amount of time dealing with the praise of two aquatic animals. I think what God is saying is, look, you can't even imagine what it's like out there. In fact, just to show you how little you know, I'm going to take this old... Uh, animal down here, and I'm going to show you how much you don't know about him. And so, for a while there, God's treating him like little kids. He's cutting us down to size is what he's doing in order to raise us up in him in heavenly places. As long as we think we know something about anything, we'll never know uh, anything about something, which as far as God is concerned. So, uh, that may be a way we can put all of this. Now, the epilogue is that... <clears throat> uh, in the, in the final, uh, final passage there, heaven passes judgment on Job's friends. 
And when God pointed Job as the intercessor, then he showed right away now that this wasn't a disgrace. This wasn't punishment that Job was involved in. And it's interesting that God changed Job's fortunes when? When he began to pray for his friends. Now the last word on this, and let me just put it this way, is that we cannot demand answers or rights from God. Let me say that again. We cannot demand answers or rights from God. But God gives to the ones who endure to the end such things as completely pass our whole understanding. All right, let's go on to Ecclesiastes now. and We're really cutting down through here. I think we're going to get through uh, in this period of time. I may, we may have to go a couple of minutes over on this session. But Ecclesiastes, a life worth living? Question mark. This is a strange book. And the viewpoint of the writer has been the subject of a lot of argument uh, in interpreters. The, actually, the preacher or Koheleth in Hebrew, uh, we're not sure what he is. Is he a real cynic? Or is he just kind of taking the devil's part or evil's part uh, in some way, like the devil's ad advocate? Or is this book a bad patchwork of different authorship uh, that's all mixed up and you get a light of hope and a ray of hope, and then you, you're depressed all over again. It's just kind of a mishmash of things that's put together. Well, there's no point in going. We don't have time to go into all of the various interpretations. But I think there are two main interpretations of Ecclesiastes that we need to touch on, and the one I'm going to choose we'll spend a little more time on. The first major interpretation views Ecclesiastes, uh, uh, this book, as Koheleth, or the preacher's debate with himself. I mean, he's really going through all of this kind of stuff. Uh, really a crazy mixed up kid. Uh, and that every now and then he gets a little flash of light and encouragement, but most of the time through the book he's cynical and he's depressed. And cynicism inevitably leads to depression. And number two, and I want you to hear this, he is torn between, between what he cannot help seeing and what he cannot help believing. Now let me put that again, because a lot of us go through that at times. If we're honest with ourselves and don't get this religious kind of a frame of mind about everything where everything is good all the time, give a positive confession, and I'm all for positive confession. But you know, if your leg is, is rotten off, you're sick. You know, you can't uh, believe that, you, you know, that it's not. That doesn't mean you can't believe that God won't heal it or that other things like that, but you have to take stock of what's there. And so, let me say that again, that this man is torn between what he cannot help seeing and between what he cannot help believing. Now, if he were a thorough cynic, he'd just believe what he saw. But he's had a touch of God, so he's got he's to believe what he sees, what he, what he understands, too. Now, uh, the second major interpretation which is one I'm more, I'm, I'm more taken to, and I, and I think there's something to say about what the, the last thing that I said, that he, there's a difference between what he can't help seeing and what he can't help believing. But I believe this is, uh, that he's, this is his, the preacher's challenge to the secularist. Some people have said that he, uh, he preaches to, or he writes from concealed premises, or from a negative apologetic. Uh, in other words, he takes the world view, the world says this is the way things are, and he pushes it to its logical conclusions. You know, I, I see the billboards that used to be around so much about cigarettes and everything, and I guess they're still out there. I've gotten where I don't pay that much attention to them. Um, can't advertise a lot of other places. But I used to think that if they all had, always had pictures of a of a cowboy, you know, or some rugged individual smoking, or a beautiful girl. But I'll tell you, if you take a, take a picture and put it up there about 20 or 30 years down the line when they've been smoking for 20 or 30 years and it looked like a hag or looked like an old bony cow himself. Uh, in other words, take this thing and take it to its logical, rational developments in that, it wouldn't be near so pretty. And so it's my feeling that Koheleth, the preacher, takes... <laughs> 
So we try to make the best out of life, and we paint it and preach it. We live in fantasy land. Uh, television has created a fantasy out there for us. We, we don't even see what we're in because we see the fantasy of that. And so Koheleth takes the, the, the stuff of life and uh, the, the motions of life, and he takes it out to its logical conclusion. And the logical conclusion is that it is all death. It's dark. It's depressing. There's nothing good out there. And that's really true when you come to think about it. Life without God, without reference to God, is that way. And Koheleth shows that. Now, let's put up an outline of the book here, uh, which is divided into really two halves, truths about God and truths about life. We'll take the one about truths about God first. And in the book, and I've called this a synthetic outline because it's not a chronal, not an outline of the things in the book. Uh, I made a synthetic outline of the things because these are scattered all over. Some things about the Creator are found down in the latter part of the book. But the truth about God is that He is the Creator. He is the disposer of all things in life. He is unsearchable. You can't find out anything about Him by searching yourself. He is the judge of all men, not just a few. And He is to be reverenced and obeyed. Now, in the truths about life, uh, he points out there are some pointers, first of all, to despair about life. And this, uh, the pointers of life about despair, first of all, are the ceaseless round of activities. Have you ever gotten just, you just wanted to get, somebody says uh, there's a song, I think, a number of years ago about life being a merry-go-round, I just want to get off. Sometimes there's such a ceaseless round of futile and circular activity that you just want to stop and get off of it for a while. Now, a second truth about life that would lead to despair, is the observation that he makes, is this fruitless search. Seems like everybody's searching for something, but they can't seem to find it. And then the other thing is the unmanageable aspect of life. It just doesn't seem, the more I try to manage things, the less they seem to be managed. I oversee a number of people here, and every time I say something about something, it seems like everything falls apart. Uh, there's, there's a principle in it. Uh, what are some of the Parkinson's principles or, you know, whatever will go wrong will go wrong, and there are all kinds of uh, corollaries of that. But he observes the fact that there's a lot of misrule, there's a lot of mischance, and finally, unexplainable death. Now, he's not going to leave it there. And so he has a mitigation of this. Now, mitigation means something that turns the effects of these things back the other ways. And so he begins to think that a mitigation of all of this uselessness, this ceaseless motion and all the rest of it, might be simple joys. You know, there's a great, there's always has been some movement in our culture to get away. There are people who are leaving all the high finance of, of Manhattan and they're going off in the woods out in Idaho somewhere trying to get simple again. I think there's more of that today. We've gotten so complex in our society, it seems like the solution to all of this that we don't understand is just to get the simple joys again. Common sense, he, uh, he speaks about. And enterprise, keep working, keep goals that are short-term until the long-term goals come about. And then there's a point of rest in all of this. Where do you come to rest is God. He says you've got to rest in God. And when man is in service to God, then he is at rest. That's his raison d'etre. That's his right, as his reason for, lift, for living. His reason for existing is God. You know, in closing, we, we survive as humanists because we pretend that we live in a hopeful world. But that's a false security. And the preacher dispels this false hope by showing that this world is really what it is, is nothing. You know, the old God is dead theology, I think, was at least honest. It said that the God that was spoken about in the Old and New Testament is not the God that's living in the church today. And as they looked at the denominational churches, or I shouldn't say denominational churches, just institutional churches and churches that were just going through the motions, that God wasn't there like He was in the Old and New Testament. They were honest about it. I think the philosophy of nihilism is at least honest because it's said by a man who doesn't know God. He doesn't have the hope of God. And as he views the world, he doesn't try to pretty it up. He doesn't try to make it look more than it is. He sees it for what it is. But he needs to hope in God. He needs to hope in God. And that is a final lesson there. Well, we've enjoyed presenting to you these
lessons, and we're going to wind up with the last lesson in this series on the prophetic books, and we'll deal with those in the last session. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the divine wisdom that comes from above. May we live and act out of your wisdom and out of your power. We ask in Jesus' name, who is wisdom and power and glory and might in himself. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.